Okay, thank you very much. So let me first by thanking the organizers for this, this very kind invitation and very happy to be here talking about quantum computation and also its connections to machine learning because I guess that that's the, the, somehow the subject behind the whole, the whole meeting. Uh, okay, let me see if I, oops, what's that? right. Okay, so I think that a couple of years ago, most of us saw these uh, headlines in the New York Times and other news, new papers in which the CEO of Google announced that the quantum computer had achieved, had reached what was called at that time the quantum supremacy, meaning that with a quantum computer, people have been able, in particular in Google, to solve a problem that with a classical computer, which would take much longer time, would take many, many years. And of course, this was something at the time that called a lot of attention of the media, of many people, of the governments, of industry. And in fact, we saw that after that, or even at that time, there were many headlines in newspapers just saying that quantum computing would have a big impact, not only in scientific research, but also in many industrial applications. And in particular, in machine learning, uh, because it was expected to accelerate some of the processes and also, I mean, to help machine learning. And so that's what I want to talk about today here. So first of all, I want to, I mean, briefly talk about quantum computing. So what's quantum computing? What is a quantum computer? Also, what can it do? And uh, also, do we really have now one of them, so we saw in the announcement that we, I mean, already have one, but it's really true. And finally, I'll uh, make a connection also to machine learning, and in that part of my talk, I also present some of the work that we are doing in our group, also in collaboration with some of the group on the connection between quantum computing and machine learning. And as you will see, there are many, many connections beyond what it's really obvious. Okay, so let me start talking about quantum physics and quantum computing. So I assume that most of the people here are not quantum scientists, and this is why I will give a just brief introduction, just I mean, putting some of the main um, let's say ideas that are required in order to understand quantum computing or what it's it about. And so, I mean, the first thing that we have to know is that quantum physics is a very old theory. I mean, it has more than 100, and 100 years old. It's not that it was discovered with quantum computation, but it's very old. So actually, it was discovered by Max Planck, who realized that if you want to describe certain experiments, it's uh, necessary that we uh, describe light as made out of small balls, small, they call it quanta, now they, we call them photons. And of course, it was at the time a big revolution because people thought that light was made out of uh, waves. I mean, um, light, if you see that, it's able to interfere with itself. And this is why it led to the idea that it was formed by electromagnetic waves. So somehow Max Planck was uh, a very uh, revolutionary idea that we have to go back to what Newton was saying 200 years ago. It should, it, it should be made out of, of uh, photons, of particles. And in fact, I mean, this led to the description of some of the experiments which were not understood at the time. So in particular, I think that Albert Einstein was the first the person who was uh, more, uh, I mean, uh, pushing for this idea of the quantum of light. And then in the 20s, 30s, and 40s of the last century, then a theory was developed. So apart from being an odd theory to describe experiments, then people found out some kind of axiomatic theory of quantum physics. And this axiomatic theory of quantum physics led to our, the best description that, what ha that we have our, about our world. So a quantum physics today describes the most elementary particles. So how these elementary particles join together to make nuclei. The nuclei together with electrons make atoms. Atoms make molecules. Molecules make solids. And everything that we see around, it's uh, described by quantum physics, by the laws of quantum physics. And apart from describing it very well, it also describes it very precisely. So in particular, today it is possible to make a prediction based on this theory, on these equations that are part of quantum physics, with 15 digits. So you can say, if we measure this quantity, it should be 1.0012457, 15 digits. And when people do the experiments and they measure, then they are able to see that it's 15 digits. And the reason is why it's 15 is because experimentally, they cannot go beyond these 15 digits. So it's a very precise, very well, and this two theory that is nowadays, and from which we understand matter, understand the things that are surrounding us. And 
also led to many applications. So this understanding allowed us to, I mean, to build semiconductors, superconductors, electronic devices, uh, computers, and whatever. So many of the things that are surrounding us are based on quantum physics and our knowledge of quantum physics. However, from the very beginning when this theory was developed in the 20s and 30s and 40s, people realized that if you take it seriously, it should, give, it should uh, change our vision of nature. So what we believe that nature was like, it's not longer true according to these laws of quantum physics. I mean, that's something that was discussed very much by some of the pioneers of quantum physics, like in this case, Einstein and uh, Niels Bohr. And they were not taken seriously. So the reason is because quantum physics, if you believe with the theory that is behind, tells you that nature is very special. So when you have a, an object in, that is described by quantum physics, the properties of that object, object does, do not need to be well defined. It's only when we observe them that they are defined. And that when you hear for the first time may not be surprising. But it's very surprising because we are used to say that even if we are not observing something, then the properties are well defined. If I say the moon, it's there even though I don't see it, well, it's somewhere, it's well defined, maybe I don't know it, but it's well defined. According to quantum physics, this is not true for the microscopic world. You cannot say an atom is there. It's not because I don't know, it's because it has not defined its position uh, well, so it's in what we call a superposition. It's in all the places at the same time. And only when we observe and we measure, the property is defined. So again, one of the rules of quantum physics is that it's not our lack of knowledge of the properties of an object, is that the object has not defined them by themselves. And that's very striking, and this was striking these pioneers. At the time, they were not able to do experiments and to check that property, whether it's true that nature is like that, but after many years, and people are able to do these experiments every day in every lab, and now we know that nature is like that. It's very shocking, but it's like that. Um, I mean, at the time, so people like Schrodinger tried to make a little bit of, uh, I mean, to, to uh, express how absurd this property of quantum physics was by extrapolating that to the macroscopic world. So you say that whatever it happens in the microscopic world, which is described by quantum physics, could be extrapolated to the macroscopic world. So it would be possible to have big objects that have not defined this property. For example, you could have a cat that is either neither uh, uh, dead or nor alive, or it's both dead and alive at the same time. And only when we look at the cat, then the property will define, and it, at that time it dies or it survives. And this happens randomly, according to some probability distribution. Of course, I mean, we understand very well why quantum physics don't, does not apply to cats, and one of the reasons is because in order to observe these properties of quantum physics, the superposition principle, the particles have to be very well isolated, and if you isolate a cat, it will die, so you will not be able to do anything, you will not keep it alive in any case. However, it is possible to observe this property with microscopic objects. So, for example, we can have atoms that obey the rules of quantum physics and can be isolated very well, and these atoms have a property which is basically atoms can be considered as small magnets. So there's a magnet, and then you can have like the North Pole pointing up. That's what we say in physics that it has a spin up, or the North Pole of the magnet can be pointing down. Then we say that it's a spin down. And according to quantum physics, it may, have, it may be that this atom has not defined still whether it's spin up or spin down. And this is what we call a superposition. It's in a superposition. And it, only when we observe it, only when we look and we ask the question, is it up or down, is the, the, the property is defined. The same thing happens with superconductors. You can have a very, very small superconductor obeying the rules of quantum physics in which the current can be clockwise or can be counterclockwise. We can assign, for example, a zero if the current is clockwise, or one if it's counterclockwise. And if we don't observe it and we prepare it under the appropriate conditions, it can be in a superposition in such a way it's doing both things at the same time. And only when you observe it, then we say that the, the, the wave function collapses, which means that this property is defined, and then it's maybe uh, clockwise. And so that's something that we uh, represent here in the language of quantum physics. Now, by assigning a bit of information to this situation, spin up, spin down, assigning zero to one of them, spin up, one to spin down, and then when we have superposition, then we write it with this language. We say alpha zero plus beta one, 
meaning that it's at the same time 0, 1, where alpha and beta are some coefficients, some complex coefficients, that tells us something about what is the probability whenever I observe that I will obtain 0 or I will obtain 1. So for example, if beta is equal to 0, then whenever I observe, I will have, uh, I will, I will have spin up because the, the 1 is not there and the other way around. So the, actually, the absolute value of alpha square is the probability that I observe 0 and or that I obtain 0 when I observe and beta square is 1, is the probability of getting 1. Now, the situation gets more interesting. You have m many of these uh, 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 quantum systems that we call quantum bits, no? because it can be not only in the state 0 and 1, but also in superpositions. And when you have many of them, then you can have a superposition of all possible configurations. So you could have, for example, the atoms that are on the left, they could be all of them in 0, or all of them in 0 and 1 and 1, meaning that the spins are, I mean, all up and 1 down or it can be one up and two down and three down and all the combinations, and you can convince yourself that there are two to the power n combinations. And according to quantum physics, if the state is well isolated and preparing the, the, the right conditions, you can have a superposition, all of them at the same time. So that's what is represented in this formula here. You'll be a superposition of two to the power n configurations. And only when we observe, only when we measure the system, then we will obtain one of these configurations that we will define at that point. So what is crucial in quantum physics is that we have an exponential number of configurations, exponential in the number of qubits, so it's two to the power n configurations, and these configurations can be uh, living at the same time while, while we don't observe and can also be manipulated. So now you act with magnetic fields or superconducting uh, devices with some electronics, then you can create the superposition, you can manipulate these, these superpositions. And this has two main consequences that are important for my talk. So the first one is that if now you try to study objects that obey the laws of quantum physics, then they will be in the superposition. So you're studying chemistry or physics, material science, high energy physics, then, I mean, the laws that describe these objects uh, are the laws of quantum physics, and therefore the state or the properties of these objects will be encoded in these superpositions. So you will have, when you want to make any prediction about how a molecule will behave or a material, what will be the properties of a material, then you will have to write what are the superpositions, and the properties will be encoded in the coefficients that are in front of the superpositions. And since there are two to the power n configurations, then you will have two to the power n complex coefficients. So this means that if you want to describe a system like that, then your computer will exploit right away. Whenever you have something like 20 or 30 electrons, then you will not be able to do any computation. And so many body quantum systems, as they appear in chemistry, in physics, and in some other subjects, because they are described by the laws of quantum physics, and because all the physical properties comes because, I mean, are rooted into the superpositions, are very, very hard to describe. And this, for example, I mean, you would be able to, uh, uh, I mean, circumvent this exponential problem, this exponential explosion of superpositions, then we would be able to deal much better with chemistry or with physics, design better materials or design better drugs, for example. This was the first consequence, difficulty. If you have a quantum system and you want to describe, you want to do something with that, it will be hard to do it. You want to use a classical computer. Now, the existence of superpositions goes, gives you also an advantage because now you can use the superpositions to do computations for you. So you have a classical computer, you typically encode the, super, the, the, the information in zeros and ones, but if you use now a quantum system, then you can encode your information also in the superpositions. And in fact, you may think that you have two to the power n superpositions living at the same time, then basically you can do two to the power n computation at the same time in parallel. And just with an n qubits, you can do two to the power n, let's say, computations. That's what was uh, coined by Richard Feynman, quantum parallelism, which means that with a quantum computer exploiting the superpositions, then you can do much more than if you don't have superpositions. Of course, still, whenever we measure, we will destroy the superposition, so this is not coming for free. It's not, only, it's not that you can do all these computations in parallel, because if you would measure at the end, then you will have just one computation, so the, you will not use the, the advantage. So what happens in quantum computing is that what you do is that you create the superpositions in the middle of the computation, 
you exploit the superpositions, and at the end, the quantum algorithm has to be clever enough in such a way that you manipulate and the superpositions disappear, and the solution I mean, appears with a high probability, the way that you measure at the end, you will get the right solution. So that's a scheme of what a quantum computer is, is uh, built with a quantum circuit, that's what is represented there. You start with a set of qubits, which are initially in the state zero. We'll, I mean, all these pins, up if there are atoms or the circuits in clockwise current if there are superconducting qubits. Then you have a set of quantum gates. These are these blue boxes which manipulate, create these superpositions and the quantum algorithm will tell you how just to have to put these quantum gates to get the advantage in the computation. Also, to get rid of the superpositions and when you measure at the end to have the solution of the problem and to hopefully this is much faster or much better, let's say, that if you use a classical computer or if you wouldn't use the superpositions at all. So quantum computers harness superpositions to solve problems more efficiently. It's not that they use this quantum parallelism, but they use the superposition, they use these other rules of quantum physics in the middle of the computation, and at the end with that you can solve some problems that we know if you find the right algorithm much more efficiently than with a classical computer. So do we have Quantum computers, well, actually, no. What we have right now are prototypes of quantum computers. So the field of quantum computation started many years ago, and until 2019, people were developing very small prototypes with two, three, four, five, 50 qubits, and in the year 2019, so Google came up with this uh, supremacy uh, experiment with 53 qubits, in which they were able to do certain computation that it was not possible to do with a classical computer. It was a very special computation. It was just built, or the, the problem that it was solved was just made it to, I mean, very, uh, uh, to be very easy with, for a quantum computer, but very difficult for a classical computer. And that's why this is the specific case in which a quantum computer has, uh, I mean, uh, gained with respect to, or has, has won with respect to classical computers. So, now, the area that we enter at that time is what we call now NISC era. So it's a uh, noise intermediate scale quantum computer. So these are quantum computers which are of the order of 50, 100, maybe up to 500 qubits, that they are not perfect because they are not completely isolated. So whenever there is this superposition, so maybe there is a molecule that goes through and crashes with one of the atoms and then part of the superposition is gone. So this means that in practice, these quantum computers are not perfect. But even though they are not perfect, the still the fact that, uh, I mean, the, the, the number of configurations is two to the power, this number, 53, in that case, is so, such, so big, there is still a hope that it will help us, not only in solving academic problems like the one at Google, but more practical problems. And that's now what most of the research is going in, the, in this area. So to find problems for which these noisy, small, but very powerful quantum computers would be better than classical computers. And if we hope that in 10, 15, 30 years, something like that, then people will be able to correct the errors, to improve the hardware, and then to make quantum computers that don't have errors. And at that time, then we know many problems for which they will be very useful. Okay? But we are not there yet. That has to be very clear now. So we, just, we have just entered the NISC era. And for a full-fledged uh, full quantum computer, it will take some time. And so, I mean, depending on whom you ask, it will be of the order of 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. We will see. Okay, so two ideas that are important for this talk. The first one, system obeying, obeying, systems obeying the laws of quantum physics are very hard to describe. Okay, that's the first one. The second, quantum computers can solve certain problems much faster than classical ones. And both of them is because of this superposition principle, because of the loss of quantum physics. Now, what is the connection with uh, machine learning, or one of the possible connections of machine learning? So I told you before that when we have a, 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 a quantum objects, or, uh, or many quantum objects, or many of these atoms, or many electrons, or many uh, quantum systems, then all the properties are encoded in what we call the physical state, which will be a superposition of all possible configurations. So you want to see if a material is superconducting or not superconducting, if a reaction will take place or will not take place, will be encoded in this coefficient C of x1, xn. This is what I called before alpha, beta, etc., which I call it like, now, like that. And we know that if we have a state of a system, this kind of system, according to the rules of quantum mechanics, if we would measure now which is the configuration, then we will obtain out of the superposition one 
particular configuration with a probability which will be given just by this coefficient square. So we have now a probability with many variables, and if you want to solve a problem in physics, then I told you before, then you should be able to have all these coefficients and to calculate all these coefficients. There are exponentially many, this is difficult. However, there might be a way of writing these coefficients in a more efficient way just by using some other particular uh, probability distributions, and that's the connection of machine learning, because in machine learning, when you want to learn some process which depends on many variables, what you want to do is to learn what is the probability distribution. So in quantum physics, we also want to learn the probability distribution, overcoming the problem of having to dis use it to, to, I mean, an exponential number, number of variables. Apart from that, oops, I think this is back here. Apart, apart from that, if you have a quantum computer now, not a quantum system, but a quantum computer, then by uh, applying certain uh, gates and measuring at the end, what will happen is that we will be sampling according to some probability distribution. So a quantum computer will generate some superposition, and if we measure, then we will be sampling according to probability distribution. And it may happen that this probability distribution, or sampling from this probability distribution, may be very hard with a classical computer. And so, for example, it may happen that you're learning some probability distribution of some classical process, and it turns out that this, uh, you want to use machine learning to learn this probability distribution, it may be very complicated. However, with a quantum computer, maybe by putting some circuits and just measuring, you will be able to sample according to that probability distribution much more efficient, and that's the other phase of or the other side of quantum computer, that maybe a quantum computer can generate very easily some probability distributions which are very difficult to generate or even to describe with a classical computer. And in fact, that's what happened with the experiment of Google. What they did at Google is just to take a random circuit, just put the random gates, and at the end measure uh, the, 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 the qubits, and the probability distribution that they obtain from which they are sampling, then it turns out that it's very difficult to sample with classical computers, and that's why they show the supremacy. I mean, people, I mean, computer scientists prove that the probability distribution described in terms of this quantum circuit is very hard to sample if you don't have a quantum computer. And since they had a quantum computer, they were sampling, and then they were able to sample according to something which was very difficult classical. And that's the, the supremacy example experiment. But this already shows the potentiality of using quantum computers in things related to machine learning. Okay, so now can now make a final connection between quantum computing and machine learning, and now we can have different cases. So first of all, we can use classical machine learning in order to help in quantum physics or in quantum computation. Why? If we have a, a problem in physics and chemistry, I told you before that at the end we are confronted to the fact of this exponential proliferation of coefficients, and so what we can use is use the ideas of machine learning to address that problem and circumvent the, this, this exponential problem, and that's what people have been doing, just getting inspired or using directly machine learning ideas to solve now many body problems in chemistry, in physics, in material science, in high energy physics, so that's uh, an area in which there is a common interest. The other is just the other way around. Use quantum computers in order to solve or to improve machine learning algorithms by what I told you before. With a quantum computer, you can generate, you can express probability distributions which are hard to do with classical computers. And so maybe these adapt better to the problem that you want to solve, and that's what people have been doing. And not only that, also trying to get inspired from quantum algorithms in order to, dis to define some other neural networks that may be more efficient than the ones that exist so far. And finally, there is a quantum to quantum in one you want to use a quantum computer to solve some quantum, um, uh, uh, some quantum problems, like quantum many body problems or quantum machine learning problems. And in fact, a couple of weeks ago, there was a, uh, an experiment by Google, a paper by Google, in which they show also supremacy in this quantum to quantum. So they have a quantum problem, so you have, basically have some, uh, some material science problem, and then they use a quantum computer to solve it more efficiently than with a classical computer. So that's the other side. So what I will do during my rest of the talk is just to give you, I mean, a couple of, of examples of, of some of these areas in which we have been working. They're maybe not so much related, but you will see that there is a lot of inspiration from one, I mean, it's more than showing something that would be very striking and say, now we can solve a problem that you cannot solve. It's not like that, but there will be some connections and inspirations between the two subjects. Okay, so uh, the first is related to 
machine learning and physics, and this, uh, I mean, it's related to something that is called tensor networks. It's something that have been working already for 20 years, and the idea of tensor networks is that if you have, in quantum physics, these uh, coefficients that depend on and these uh, uh, n variables, these two to the power n coefficients, you can see these coefficients as a tensor, as a tensor that has some legs, these are the red lines that correspond to the bits x1, xn, and what we do in tensor networks is, of course, this tensor has uh, n, n legs, so it's, it's rank n tensor, it has to do the power n coefficients, so what we can try to express in terms of smaller tensors that have much less uh, coefficients, but they are contracting according to some graph. That's what is written on the, on, the, on the right. So the tensor network idea is just to take a big tensor that you cannot fit in your computer and to write it in terms of small tensors that you can fit in your computer that are contracted according to what we call auxiliary indices. And what is very nice in, in physics is that you can prove mathematically that these tensor networks give you an efficient description of many of the problems that I mentioned before related to physics. So you can, I mean, prove mathematically that something that we and some other people have done is that if you have a problem in condensed matter physics or in, in many body physics, if you're looking at uh, ground state or you have at zero temperature the behavior, then you can really prove that these tensors will provide you an efficient description of the system, meaning that the number of parameters only scales polynomially with the, with the, I mean, the, the, the number of qubits that you have in your original system. And now you can have a one-dimensional geometry. This is what is called matrix product states, two-dimensional geometry, which are called projected entangled pair states. And now some of you may recognize that because in the, in the, in the case of machine learning, people use what we call matrix product state, but they call uh, tensor trains. And the only difference is that we use complex coefficients, but um, people in machine learning use positive coefficients for them. And so, actually, this is uh, tensor networks is basically the, 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 the tool now to describe many body systems. So, in particular, you have a one dimensional problem. So, like you have a cable and you want to describe the physics of a cable that obeys the roles of quantum physics, then the method of choice is, is uh, uh, these tensor networks. You go to two dimensions, then, I mean, the, there is a lot of progress during the couple of years. And actually, for example, now it's possible to describe the motion of electrons in a material very well with these tensor networks. You don't have to pay attention to what is the plot showing, but this is what is done in the left side with the Simons Foundation grant. They were able to describe very well a problem that was open for many years. On the right-hand side, so that's something that we did, use these tensor networks to solve a problem in high energy physics, which was complex with previous methods. And, but still, I mean, that's very complicated. And the reason why it's complicated is because at the end, when you want to do a computation with these tensor networks, you have to contract the tensors. And contracting the tensors in one dimension is very efficient, but in higher dimensions is very difficult. Actually, you do it exactly, it's an exponential problem again. It takes an exponential time in a classical computer. And that's why in two dimensions, you need some algorithms to do that that go efficient, work efficiently. But in three dimensions, there is no chance. So basically, you cannot use these tensor networks for a three-dimensional material. So that's why, uh, so if you look at the field of tensor network states, these would be the ones that I mentioned before. Then in the past, so some of us look at some other ways of contracting these tensors, and that would be more efficient than do it exactly. And so in particular, we did it using some sampling, some Monte Carlo methods. And it turns out that some of these tensors, out of all possible tensors, so a few of them, or some of them, can be contracted efficiently using sampling, using Monte Carlo. And in fact, what you can do is that you can generalize the concept of tensor networks by taking now the ones that can be uh, efficiently sampled with Monte Carlo and extending them. And so that's why, I mean, we and some other people came up with what we call string bond states and people call near quantum neural network states. And these are generalizations of tensor networks, which would include, I mean, your language uh, restricted Boltzmann machines and, and some other things. And then we applied to these problems that we could not solve with tensor networks, and we were very successful. So, for example, we were able to solve a problem in three dimensions, which was impossible with tensor networks, and also to solve some problems in, in some exotic models in two dimensions, which were not possible to solve with tensor networks now with a different, with a different methods. It turned out that the best method that we found was based on this restricted Boltzmann machine. So the idea if you want is to use for this psi of x1, x2, some restricted Boltzmann machine neural network, and then to minimize the energy or to find the solution just by, in the same way that people do it with, with, with classical machine learning. Anyway, so 
since we were successful with these methods in solving some problems that were difficult in quantum many-body systems, then we decided to apply the same problems to classical many-body quantum systems. And so we applied to the typical uh, MNIST uh, data set. And so at the time, this was, actually, the paper was published in 2020, but was submitted in 2018 to a conference. And so you see that, well, I mean, the best method that we got was 92.3% with this method, which was relatively good. I mean, could not compare to Google Net yet, but was very good I mean, for the standards at that time. I guess that now uh, the, the, the solutions are much better. We also applied to some noise models, and we got very reasonable results. So, uh, I mean, some people also took over, and now the connection between tensor network, extension of tensor networks, now classical machine learning, it seems to be a very interesting area of research. And just to finish up, let me mention some connection now to quantum computing. So it's a paper that we published very recently, I mean, a month ago, together with people in Harvard, Michel Lukin, the group of Michel Lukin. And uh, so the idea is to take something that is well known in, in machine learning. These are Bayesian networks that you know very well with this probability distribution that you want to find out, to, to, to find for generative, uh, for uh, um, unsupervised learning, for example, can be written as some product of probability or conditional probability distribution according to some graph. So in particular, you can have what are called K-gram models. It's are very old-fashioned models that were used in the past, that were used in natural language processing, and was before, I mean, the deep learning appeared. And you can also have some other kind of Bayesian net networks like hidden Markov models, which I mean I will not uh, show here, but they are very classical and they can be used in different, in different, in different places. And in particular, two days ago, the Prince of Asturias Award was given to some people who develop some of these models. So one of them developed these these, these models. And so I mean the key point of our work is to realize that these K-gram models and these hidden Markov models can be very easily generated with quantum computers. So for the first one, this K-gram model, then you can have a very simple quantum circuit that is what is represented in the, in the, at the beginning. And you just would run this very simple quantum circuit and do measurements of your qubits at the end. They will sample this K-gram uh, probability distribution. And so what you can do is to say, well, since this is very simple to create with a quantum computer, why don't we get a quantum gate at the very end and do the measurement after apply a quantum gate? And so this will not be a K-gram model anymore. And so actually what we were able to show is that this cannot be a K-gram model anymore. So if you would like to describe this probability distribution that you get after applying the circuit plus an additional gate and measuring, then this will require an n-gram model. So this would require that all the, the, the bits are connected to all the bits, which has an exponential I mean, uh, uh, overhead in the case of the k-gram grommet. So this means that a quantum computer, just by adding a single gate, can be much more expressive than this model here. And we did the same thing, now it's a bit more complicated, by for the hidden Markov model. You can also see that any hidden Markov model can be created with a very simple quantum circuit. And if you add now a gate at the end, then you will have something which costs you exponential resources if you would like to do it now in terms of hidden Markov model. And well, this was a, a, a mathematical proof what we did, but we also did some uh, numerical calculations. And so we look at the kullback leibler uh, divergence and so on. I don't want to bore you with that. But what we saw that for some particular databases that exist on the market, then if you use the hidden Markov model or you use the hidden Markov model to plus the quantum gate, then the quantum gate would be much more expressive than, than the other one. Of course, here we have not studied uh, efficiency nor anything else. That's, I mean, they will depend on how fast the quantum computer is or how, how it is, but at least it gives you that it may happen that indeed with this small quantum computer, with simple qubit, I mean, what you learn from machine learning, you can add just a little bit of quantum at the end and become more expressive. And so with that, I would like to finish. So first is, well, I mean, going to the last part of my talk, quantum neural networks. These are the ones that you say are created starting from tensor networks and adding something else that are easy to, to uh, uh, to sample using Monte Carlo methods. 
improve the performance of tensor networks. That's the traditional tool that we use in condensed matter physics and allow us to do computation that we are not able to do with tensor networks. So the input that we get from machine learning so help us to solve problems now in physics and hopefully in chemistry as well. And also is that the other way around. Now these uh, neural networks and tensor networks can inspire methods in machine learning. And so we have seen actually people working in machine learning with tensor trains and so on, that there have been a lot of, of work on that direction as well. Also, uh, I was uh, well, I mean, giving some details, so maybe just the last part of my, my talk was that uh, if you have now machine learning, uh, neural networks based on machine learning, if you find a way of creating them very easily with a quantum computer, then you can put a little bit of quantum, just putting a couple of gates, which would be relatively simple, and do the measurements, and this neural network can become much more expressive at the end, and it has an advantage. I didn't have time to speak about that here, but if you want to use now a quantum computer only without the machine learning, let's say just a quantum, a quantum circuit, and, uh, and to, um, uh, let's say, train with some data, some classical data, this, this quantum circuit, it turns out that it's very difficult, that you have to do many, many, many measurements. You have small gradients or exponentially small gradients and so on. However, so what we are saying here is that actually just train it, train your, your neural network classically, and once you have trained it, just add this layer of quantum, and then you will be able to improve, and this, may, this will not be as difficult as the, to train the whole quantum computer, which requires a lot of measurements. So that's something that we are currently investigated, and I mean, we hope that we have a quantum computer that can uh, help us to show that, uh, let's say, not only theoretically, but more in a practical problem. And with that, I'd like to finish, and thank you for your attention. So, is there any question uh, for uh, Ignacio? I was waiting. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, so there's quite a few like hardware approaches towards building NIST computers and eventually scalable computers. Do you have a preference or maybe one that you think will be more likely to succeed than the others? Uh, and why, why that one in particular? So there is a race on different platforms to build a quantum computer, a NIST quantum computer that's better and more powerful. So we have on the one hand superconducting qubits as the technology that Google, IBM, and many others are used. There is a technology of trap ions. That's the one that other companies are using. And these were like kind of head to head, let's say, for, for a while. So the superconducting qubits can have more qubits, but the ions are better qubits, have less errors. And, but uh, I mean, a few months ago, there was a third technology that uh, popped up and that's based on Rydberg atoms. And so they were able to build a quantum computer with 256 qubits that have high quality qubits, better than the ones that they have in the other technologies. So I would say that now is the one that took over. However, it's very likely that there will be some other quantum computer based on superconducting qubits that at some point will get better. So I think that at the moment is a race. There is not a def definite winner, but I would say that now, I mean, the ones that I see with more potential are the ones based on these neutral atoms, these Rydberg atoms, and the one on superconducting qubits. There is also the one based on photons that they are doing a lot of, of advances. They have also some quantum supremacy experiments. However, they don't correspond to the qubit-based quantum computers. So they, I mean, it's, let's say they, they have like many photons that are not qubits, and then they can uh, show that a, if you would like to describe what they have in the experiment with a classical computer, it would take uh, an exponential time, right? But that's not a, it's, it's, this cannot be used as a quantum computer to solve some other problems. So I would say that these are the four technologies that are leading, but it may even happen now in Australia. There are some results now with quantum dots where they also have better times, less errors, and so on. So that's still a race. So we are at the beginning. And it will take a long time until one of them wins, 10, 15, 20 years. However, in the meantime, with this 100 up to 1,000 qubit quantum computer, it's likely that some of these problems related to machine learning or something else, I mean, may get some advantage. That, I think that's what is being uh, investigated at the moment.
Hello. Uh, I'm working right now with the European Commission in reviewing uh, quantum computing uh, projects, and they they have the 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 objective of uh, having a 1,000 uh, qubit fault tolerant from the end of this decade. And they are like uh, very optimistic that they, they can, in, uh, in Europe, we can uh, build this kind of uh, quantum computing, but at the same time, I have the impression that they think that we are lagging behind the big tech companies in the United States. So we have a very interesting objective, and uh, but uh, we are uh, and we are uh, in the in the test a uh, uh, Europe is pioneer, pioneer in in this quantum computer technologies. But I have the impression that they well this is worse, but they think that they are not so pioneering. Uh, what do you think about? Okay, so. Uh I mean, the first question is this, uh, at the end of the decade, that they will have a fault-tolerant quantum computer of 1,000 qubits. I think that that's very optimistic, yeah. really optimistic. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I mean, you can just Google in the internet, just Google, and write IBM quantum computer or whatever, uh, Google quantum computer. I mean, you will see that there is a dilution refrigerator that is of this size. And uh, what is inside are 50 qubits. And for each of the qubits, you have to put a cable. And they have to be at basically, I mean, a millikelvin, which is a very low temperature, much lower than it's in the middle of the galaxy, so you have to make in the lab. And each of the cables that enter here, I mean, they heat up a little bit. And now you can imagine that if you want to build a fault-tolerant quantum computation, then you will have to use a recorrection, and this recorrection comes with an overhead. The overhead is a factor of 1,000 to 10,000. So this means that if you want to have a 1,000 qubit quantum computer, you will have to build a 10 million qubit quantum computer that will have to fit in this refrigerator. It will not fit in this refrigerator. It will have to be of the size of this room, more or less, and it will have to be at this temperature. Of course, I mean, it's, I mean uh, when 10 years technology will evolve a lot, and people will manage, and they will engineering, but I mean, it's hard to believe that this can happen, especially if you see that these guys are working on that since 2012, and, and in eight years, they made a lot of progress, but they didn't do that progress. So that's why I still believe that it's a little bit optimistic. It may happen, but it's optimistic. Now, the second question is uh, related to Europe, US, and especially China. Um, so um, I would say that the leading uh, industry it's, it was in the US. So this was because in 2000, this is what I showed in my diagram, 2012, the American tech companies decided to enter the game, and then they have the engineering that we don't have in the laboratories in our research centers, and they have the resources and everything else. Now, when there was the, the, the Google quantum computer supremacy, then people learned that China was investing a factor of basically 30, more than the whole American together. And this uh, uh, co uh, created a chain reaction. Then the EU said, well, come on, so we, why don't we have a quantum computer? It's either in the US, which, I mean, maybe you cannot trust 100%, even though, I mean, they're like I'm very close friends of the Europeans. There is in China, which maybe you cannot trust 100%, so we should have technological sovereignty, so we should build them here. But when they look around, there is no the industry that there is in the US, and then there is not the money that is in China, so we have to do something else. And that's why the independent governments start to say, okay, so let's try, let's try to create the startups, let's try to convince our companies to build them. I mean, know very well the, the case of Germany. It was, uh, I mean, the, I mean the, the, the Germany created the commission of experts to um, uh, advise uh, the, the counselor at that time. And so we were saying, okay, so you should build quantum computers, of course, but where? So can you ask Siemens to build a quantum computer? Siemens will tell you, well, I mean, I'm not going to build something that will have my revenues in 10 years or 15 years. So that's why they decided to give $2 billion uh, uh, to build quantum computers. And now, I mean, it's being done together with the industry, but still the industry is not in. It's done still in the labs with the help of the industry. And this makes it much more difficult than in the US, where you have these big companies, big tech companies, or in China, in which they still do it in the, well, Alibaba has also some brand, but in the academy, uh, you see, when you, I told you before about this engineering problem, not that you have to put these million qubits in a dilution refrigerator. So you go to a lab, in our, um, in Munich, or a lab in Delft, or a lab even in Google, or in IBM, you'll see that they have something like four or five of these dilution refrigerators, because you are trying something there, then the engineers are trying something there, trying something there. So you go to Tsinghua, or you go to uh, 
Shanghai University, you see a corridor with maybe 200 dilution refrigerators, okay, which they are doing in parallel. This, so that's a different level, and so that's why it gets very difficult in this competition to, I mean, uh, uh, first of all to go, I mean, to compete with the industry, and second to compete with the funding that they have in other systems. But still, and something that we have to, we have to go. I mean, uh, Europe cannot cannot be behind, cannot lie behind, and that's the goal, and that's why. So, for example, this other technology of uh, atoms that I mentioned before, which is very much advanced, then it turns out that we have one of the leading groups, if not the leading group in Europe, or two of the leading groups in Europe. So we believe that this could be a chance and that's, uh, that will be advanced. And actually, this is, for example, what our institute is doing, is betting on, on that one. But still, it's a tough, it's a tough uh, competition. Uh, originally, the ENIAC uh, was a computer the size of the room, so... Uh. Right, how many years did it take until you had it of a size like that? Probably not five, no? Um, well, thanks, Ignacio, for, for your talk. Um, my, my question was actually a bit related to this last comment, and because this, uh, we might throw this parallelism between the, the, the first computers in the, in, the, in the 50s and the personal computers starting in the 80s, and, and so 30 years from that huge thing to, to, the, to the personal computer, or 40. Well. But uh, I don't know if in the case in, the, in, in quantum computers may be uh, different, uh, because uh, you were also talking about this, uh, the Kelvin, uh, the big refrigerators, and um, the, uh, for example, reducing one, one degree Kelvin is not uh, linear. Uh, the, the effort you, you have to take to, 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 to do this. I'm, I'm not an, a physics expert, but I, I have the impression that there's something more exponentially complex so, to achieve that. So um, in, in that sense, uh, making the, the progress that we can make with quantum computers, do you see that can be at the same pace as we com as compared to the to the first computers, um, or maybe exponentially? Um, yeah. This okay. One. So so, I mean, first of all, so we, will, we can look at history and learn something. And so, what we learned in classical computation is what was the what changed uh, the 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 game changer at the time was the tra the transistor. So first they had the bulbs that were enormous, and then they created the transistors, and then they started ma making it smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and this is why uh, pushed the whole field. Of course, if there was something like that, there was a kind of the quantum transistor that would make the change, then probably things could go very fast. However, I mean, that's a speculation, so we don't know if, because it has not been discovered. We don't know what it is, what is a quantum transistor. Not like they didn't know that the transistor was before they discovered it. Now, what is also true is that, uh, of course, at that time it took a very long time. It took, I mean, 30, 40 years in order to have, uh, let's say, reasonable computers. And when I talk about quantum computers, I think that it can, it can take uh, uh, less than that. I say 10, 15 years, 30 years. And the reason is because there are different technologies. And some of them can have bottlenecks, and that's expected. So, for example, the one on superconducting qubits, I think that they had several bottlenecks. The one that I told you about, these dilution refrigerators, and have to put electricity the, in something that is very, very cold. I mean, it's, it's kind of counterintuitive. It may work, but that's difficult. However, there are these other technologies that are popping, popping up. And these other technologies, some of them require room temperature. I mean, they don't have to be at, at, uh, at uh, zero Kelvin. And some of the ones required a lot, I mean, very high vacuum. So, for example, the ones on atoms, then the only problem that you have, the main problem that you have there is that there is another molecule that, I mean, turned out that you didn't take out, and then it collides. So what you have to do is you have to get out all the molecules. And so, so there are many options, and I think that some of them will survive and probably will go faster than expected. So this happened with these uh, Rydberg atoms, the one that I mentioned at the beginning. So three years ago, there was uh, maybe a qubit or single qubit or two qubits. And now all of a sudden we have these 256 in which they even, I mean, uh, you run an algorithm to solve the max cut problem, some optimization problem, it run relatively well. There's some, some kind of advantage here and there, but it was a really breakthrough that took a couple of years or three years. So that's why, I mean, it may happen that one of these technologies takes over and that, uh, that's, I think, that is very good. And that's also why it's very good not to bet on a single technology. The EU is, is also doing that, is betting on several technologies because we know which, which, which one is the winner. So, so you basically, you don't see any physical constraint on the possibility to find in this quantum transistor. There is no... 
No, 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 no. So physical. what we know, I mean, if you, if I, I started working on this field in the mid 90s or even earlier, and at that time there was a fundamental problem. So quantum computer could not work. And the reason is because, you know, you have this exponential gain, exponential speed up. However, uh, uh, at that time, no error was allowed. And so you can very easily check by yourself with a very, back of the, with a very simple back of the envelope calculation that you have n qubits, you run a computation, and you don't want to have any single error, because otherwise, if there is an error in the middle of the computation, then it will propagate and will give you a completely right result. So the probability for this to happen is the probability that the first qubit has no error, and the second qubit, and the third qubit, and the fourth qubit, so it's p to the power n is also exponential going down. And this completely kills the exponential advantage, so the probability that there are no errors. For, this is why at the time it was a game. I mean, it, was, it will never work because there will always be errors and there will be exponentials, so it will never uh, uh, scale. However, in 1997, Peter Shor, who was the same, who came up with the Shor's algorithm for factorization, came up with quantum error correction and with fault-tolerant quantum correction and showed that actually this is not necessary. It's not necessary that there are no errors. The only thing is that they have to happen at a sufficiently slow rate. And if this is true, then you will be able to correct them. And so we know now that there is no fundamental impediment to building, a, to scaling up a quantum computer. However, it's very hard. Okay, that's the difference between the two things. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Thirak, for your conference. It was very inspiring. Uh, yesterday we were discussing also on um, this um, difference between red uh, artificial intelligence and green artificial intelligence and what we need to do for a sustainable uh, future. And uh, how can um, I understand that uh, quantum computing can speed up uh, quite a lot mm -hmm. um, machine learning, but uh, are we saving energy with all the things that we need to do with this refrigerator and this quantum computing? How, how, how is this going to be? Okay, so that's um, a very interesting question that people are paying more and more attention, is whether a quantum computer can help to save energy. Because even though it may not be that fast or it may have errors and may not compete so much at the level of these NIST experiments, it may turn, it may, it may turn out that it uh, consumes much less energy. And uh, I mean, at the moment, that's not true. And this is not true because um, for these 50 qubits, then you need I mean, a whole lab full of electronic devices that consume uh, a lot of energy. But I guess that this is a, uh, where the progress is expected. So I, I would believe that, yes, now using quantum computers, it would be possible to decrease, and for some particular problems, the consumption of energy on the one hand. So this, I believe that this will be true. I don't know when it will happen, but it's likely to happen at some point. And which will be a, a, a motivation, as good motivation as having a quantum computer because it speeds up the process. The second point, which is, I think, very interesting, and that's uh, something that occurred during the last couple of years, is that uh, people found out that a quantum computer, even one of these niche quantum computers, can be used for something that is classically impossible, that is classically impossible in our world, which is, uh, certified random number generation. Let me just, uh, I think that that's something very interesting. So you know that uh, if I, uh, you play Lotto, and then somebody appears on TV and says the number is two, four, five, six, seven, then how do you know that this person didn't create the number beforehand, told some of uh, a friend of hers, and this person bought, bought the number, and then, I mean, it's cheating. So there is no way of certifying that a number didn't exist before it was created, at least classically. However, quantum mechanically, that's possible. And it turns out that and the, the basic idea is very simple. If you have a superposition of that, then according to the rules of quantum mechanics, you measure, then the, run, the, 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 the result will be completely random, in, in, impossible to predict. This is one of the principles of quantum, quantum physics. Mm -hmm. And so if you make sure that there is a quantum computer and that they have a superposition and ask to measure, then you will make sure that the number is random and everybody will 
um, can make sure that this number is completely random. And there are protocols that computer scientists now have developed to make sure that there is a superposition and there is a quantum computer that creates these random numbers. And that's very interesting. And now I connect it to energy consumption because in some uh, applications like blockchain, you know that there is a lot of data mining, which is done because you cannot trust somebody just distributing who is the one who is responsible for the next block. So they have to fight for that, and then one of them will win ran kind of randomly, and that's how it's chosen. So if there was a way of certifying that you're completely fair in distributing that, then this will save a lot of energy. And so that's one of the possible applications, so people are studying that, but where quantum computers could help in, let's say, in energy consumption, and that could not be anticipated. Nobody had this idea of uh, certified random number generations, and it appeared a couple of years ago. Very interesting, thank you. Yeah, I, I will actually have two questions uh, myself. So. If you were to say between, uh, I mean, there's a lot of debate about Europe losing uh, against uh, the big two powers, China and the US. So this is one of the critical issues because having a quantum computer, a good quantum computer, not only means having it, it means better materials, better chemicals, better pharmaceuticals, et cetera, et cetera. So if you were to, to, to rate today between one and 10 how critical it is for Europe or for any geopolitical bloc to uh, take this into take this seriously, how, how do you think how critical that is? I think it would be a ten. It would be very critical. I mean, you, you just say that. Imagine that now somebody who is not Spain or Europe and has a quantum computer and all of a sudden starts developing drugs that are much more efficient than any drugs and have the patents for that. They have creating new materials that are much more powerful for military uses or whatever. I mean, start doing that. And if they are not your friends and they want to share this with you, then they have a big advantage. Just even now with uh, blockchain, I mean, uh, blockchain, you know that you have superiority in computation then you can cheat it. You have more than 50% 50, 50 of the power, then you can cheat it. With a quantum computer, it's not an exponential acceleration, but the one that has is enough to win that. So all of a sudden, you will have many places where this quantum computer would be useful, not to speak about the ones that we don't know yet and that will come up. And so I think that's a very critical installation. So I think that one has to do two things. So first of all is to keep an eye on how the development is going to see when the other people will have such a quantum computer, this scalable quantum computer. And the second is to do it yourself because at some point, I mean, with some of the countries, we are very friendly and we share a lot of uh, information and so on, but you, we also need some sovereignty. So that's why it's not only me who says that it's a 10. I think that many governments think that it's a 10 and that's why there is so much emphasis in promoting quantum computation. Uh, I mean, you are in the field, so are you feeling uh, some preservations uh, already in, with researchers or companies that it has, we are going from an open community, research communities, to something more close? I think that we have not reached that level yet. It will come soon. And the reason is because we still have these prototypes of quantum computers. And at the moment, it's more to show that you are better rather than to hide it and to do things on, in the back. So whenever, and I mean, you have seen it, I mean, uh, four weeks ago, Chinese have another, or the Canadians had a, another supremacy experiment with photons, and they wanted to show that they were in, before the Chinese beat Google, and so on. So this was this kind of competition. I mean, from the academic point of view, and even from the companies, I think that we know very well where things are, and so we have some error margin that is sufficiently good to know how things are evolving. At some point, it may go in some other uh, direction, and then it will be it will be uh, difficult to taste. However, we are always in the, in the in this in this position. So just let me give you one example. So imagine that NSA finds a classical factoring algorithm. They will not tell anybody, right? I mean, because they could decipher all the the the, the, the encrypted messages in the world, and nobody could figure out that they have it. So it may happen at some point that there is some step at which then you want to pretend that you don't have it anymore, but you are developing some, some other, uh, let's say, technology that without telling anybody else. This is very unlikely to happen at the moment, very, very unlikely to happen at the moment, but it may happen in the future. And uh, I mean, now there's classical computers, I mean, we code them in programming languages and there is compilers and there yep. is, there is a, like a bon, bon Neumann model for them. So uh, at the, quantum computers are more like uh, niche applications. So 
is there any any research or results on having a general purpose quantum computing, even if only in theory, and how does it look like? How does the computational model look like? Is it gonna be like an FPGA that you hard code the gates, or how, how does it look like? Okay, so you, we have the equivalent to assembly message for a general purpose quantum computer, and that's very well developed. So now there are some languages, some more uh, uh, I mean advanced languages. I mean, IBM has their own. I don't know, Honeywell, Quantinium have another language, so they are competing languages. In such a way that even if you don't know quantum physics, it's relatively yeah, easy to, to program a quantum computer because you don't have to know whether the cat is dead or alive, and you just have to know that there is a probability distribution, and that gate, and that gate, and that gate will do that. It's purely abstract and mathematically. And so once you learn that, you learn the language of how to program that, that you can do it right away. And that's why there are many companies, many startups just doing software and using these languages, even, I mean, employing people who maybe didn't study quantum physics, but just computer science, and then they just learn how, how this, this works, and, and, and that's possible. So I'm not an expert on that, but I know that many people are doing that. So let me just quote uh, something that I like a lot. So there is a computer scientist called Scott Aronson. He's very famous because he's a quantum computer scientist who has a very famous blog, and it's uh, very, very funny. So you have the opportunity to listen to him, YouTube or wherever, you have a look at him. He's a computer scientist, and he says that quantum computer is extremely simple as long as you get rid of the physics part, okay? So that's, that's, that's really true. I mean, it's quantum computer, you can formulate it. It's very easy to, to understand. It's just an, it's kind of, I mean, you know a little bit about stochastic um, calculation is very similar. So, yeah, and then programming, it's also relatively simple. So I don't think that that's that difficult. Well, thank you for, uh, for the amazing talk.